Welcome to ID the Future, a podcast about intelligent design and evolution. Welcome to ID the Future. I'm Annika Smith, and on today's episode, we're featuring an interview with Casey Luskin on the radio program Sound Reason, where he talked about what the Dover trial meant for teaching intelligent design and explained just what irreducible complexity is. This is Sound Reason, where today's culture and timeless truths come together. It's Reason Relevant Radio, with answers to the tough questions you need to know. Now, from the campus of Southern Evangelical Seminary, Sound Reason with Alex McFarland. Welcome back to Sound Reason. Glad to have you with us. This is Alex McFarland coming to you from Southern Evangelical Seminary in Charlotte, North Carolina, where America comes to learn apologetics. Got a great show today. We're going to have in the second half of the show Casey Luskin from the Discovery Institute to talk about irreducible complexity. It's Science Friday. We kind of on Fridays generally touch on something related to science and faith. Well, Casey Luskin is the program officer for the Center for Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute, and we're very honored anytime we have a representative on from Discovery, because they're they're doing some vital work, and uh, we want you to know about that. And then we're going to talk about uh, irreducible complexity, fascinating subject, very timely. Um, Casey, thank you for holding, and welcome to Sound Reason. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, gl- glad to have you on. Hey, tell the listeners briefly about the Discovery Institute and what, what the organization is all about, and then specifically what you do there. Well, Discovery is basically a public policy think tank based in Seattle, Washington. Uh, Discovery actually deals with a lot of issues. Uh, We're probably most well-known for our work on the intelligent design uh, evolution debate, but we actually do a lot more than that. We have programs to deal with transportation and technology and foreign affairs and communications. But as I said, uh, we're probably most uh, infamous or famous, depending on who you ask, for our work within the uh, intelligent design issue. Um, As far as intelligent design goes, our primary goal and our primary aim is actually to help develop intelligent design as a scientific research program and see it develop as a legitimate scientific alternative to neo-Darwinian evolution. So we fund quite a bit of research, uh, such as the Biologic Institute, uh, just started a new scientific journal called Biocomplexity, and uh, helping uh, scientists to publish peer-reviewed journal articles that uh, investigate intelligent design. Um, And then we also deal with the issue as far as education goes, and that's more where my uh, role fits in. Uh, I'm an attorney with a science background, and I uh, work in public policy advising parents and teachers and school board members and uh, the occasional state legislator that comes our way to help them to uh, understand how they can teach evolution more objectively without getting into legal trouble. And we think that uh, you certainly don't have to teach just the evidence for evolution in the dogmatic fashion that's usually taught. There's much better ways to deal with the issue, and I try to help uh, help uh, educators to do that without ending up in court with the ACLU. In, indeed, indeed. Well, hey, I don't want to get us too far off script, so if, if um, w- the question I'm about to ask is maybe not uh, something you would care to discuss, feel free to veto this. But um, speaking of what is taught in schools, talk to us a little bit, Casey, about the, the Dover, Pennsylvania case several years ago and just what that was about and, and, in your opinion, what the significance of it was. Sure, I don't mind talking about that at all. Um, some of your listeners may have heard of this case. It was a lawsuit that came out of central Pennsylvania in 2005, where basically a pretty small school district re- required its teachers to read a very short oral disclaimer to students in biology class before they learned about evolution. And, and basically, uh, over the course of two or three sentences, this short statement mentioned intelligent design and said, if you want to learn more about it, you can go to the library and read a book called Of Pandas and People. And uh, even that was a bridge too far for some of our friends in the Darwin lobby at the ACLU. They promptly filed a lawsuit asking the court to ban intelligent design from science classrooms in the school district. And unfortunately, the judge uh, agreed with the ACLU's arguments. Um, And it's a pretty, you know, I could get into a lot of detail about what was wrong with the ruling, but the judge did rule that intelligent design is religion and unconstitutional to teach. Uh, maybe just one preliminary point. I'm, I'm happy to talk about this as much as you'd like, Alex, but 
Uh, some folks will say that intelligent design has therefore been banned in public schools in the U.S., and that is certainly not true. This case was from the lowest level of the federal courts, from the federal district court level. It does not apply really outside of the parties in this case in the middle district of Pennsylvania. So I don't think that it's fair to say that ID has been banned. It's the only case so far that has addressed the teaching of ID, and the U.S. Supreme Court has certainly not uh, addressed this topic. So um, ID has not been banned in the United States, and I'd I like to think that uh, it will one day get a fair shake in court, uh, whereas this was not a very good case for testing intelligent design. Yeah, I, I do think the conventional wisdom, I mean, a lot of people, even Christians, assume somehow that that did ban the teaching of ID in public schools, but but it's good to know that's not the case. I mean, certainly many of our opponents would love to ban intelligent design for public schools. They like to ban anything, basically, that challenges Darwin. You know, back in the 1920s, we had the Scopes trial, where it was the so-called, you know, uh, bigoted, closed-minded fundamentalists, if you've watched Inherit the Wind, who wanted to ban ideas they didn't like, such as evolution. But today, in 2010, it's completely the opposite. The people who are trying to, trying to ban ideas from students are the Darwin lobbyists, who want to ban ideas like ID or even just simple criticisms of evolution. Uh, whenever we deal with this issue at the public policy level, the, uh, our opponents are constantly trying to prevent students from learning about the scientific criticisms of evolution, even though they come from you know, mainstream peer-reviewed scientific journals. They don't want students to hear about these things. So there's very much an agenda to teach evolution in a very one-sided fashion. I think it's very dangerous for students. Well, let's get to, to irreducible complexity. Um, what is that? And, and let, let me ask you this, Casey. Um, I know when like people like Richard Dawkins are, are on on the the news, they'll um, in a very condescending way sometimes they'll say, "Well, you know, these are lofty scientific concepts, and lay people just simply can't understand it and can't intelligently discuss." You know, what is ID? What is uh, irreducible complexity? And and really, is it fair for uh, you know we uh, plebeians, quote unquote, lay people to to feel like we can act you know accurately get a handle on these things? Well, I think that anyone who wants to study evolution can do so, and. The way I like to put it is that if they can teach the evidence for evolution in, in public school science classrooms, and there's no reason that students can't learn about the evidence against evolution. If they can understand the arguments for a particular proposition, what principled reason is there that they can't learn the arguments against that proposition? I, I just don't see why people can't understand uh, the evidence on one side but not the other. And when I talk to folks, especially students, they get quite offended when they're told that, you know, some of the scientific challenges to evolution are too complicated for them to learn. Um, Darwin certainly did not think that the challenges to his theory were, were very complicated. In Origin of Species, he laid out a very clear and concise and easy to understand task of his theory. And he wrote uh, a quote from Origin of Species. He said, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, then my theory would absolutely break down. So oh, wow. the key phrase right there, Alex, is numerous successive slight modifications. Darwinian evolution works through small stepwise changes, each of which is supposed to provide a selective advantage that natural selection will preserve in the organism, some kind of a benefit that allows that organism to survive and reproduce better than other organisms in the population. And if it has this slight advantage, then it will be able to leave more offspring, and this, the population will essentially evolve in its favor, and, and it will be able to have its genes uh, passed on to the next generation. Um, so numerous successive slight modifications. Darwinian evolution does not work very well when you have structures that provide no function or no benefit until lots of complexity is present all at once. And that is essentially the idea of irreducible complexity. The idea is that there are some structures in biology that require many parts to be present all at once in order to get any function whatsoever. And since natural selection will not preserve a structure if it does not function and provide a benefit to the organism, how are you going to evolve such a structure in a step-by-step -step fashion? You have to have all of the parts there in order to get any function. It cannot be evolved in a step-by-step -step, uh, pathway where it remains functional and provides an advantage at each step. You have to have tons of, lots of parts present all at once to get any function. And so the idea is that it's irreducibly complex because if you were to reduce the complexity and take away a part or tweak a part, then it will stop functioning. And so we, uh, Michael Behe is a uh, pro-ID scientist who's 
come up with this term, irreducible complexity, to describe a system that meets that challenge that Darwin laid down in Origin of Species. Um, yeah, what do you say, though, to um, you know, evolutionists who say, well, you know, irreducible complexity, um, we, we think there's no way that these parts could have evolved independently of the other, but maybe let's just wait and see. Maybe some mecha mechanism will be discovered by which they could have come about. Um, and hey, Scott, Casey, let me say we're, we're up on a break. So let me pose that question to you again after this break. We're talking with Casey Luskin from the Discovery Institute. Uh, Casey, uh, before the break, I wanted to sort of ask this question and maybe I'm, um, awkwardly asking it, but I've heard evolutionists say, um, you know, not only, uh, in the media, but on this show, ones that we've had on to dialogue and debate with that, you know, well, y you Christians, you, you, you know, creationists and you intelligent design advocates, you say that things are irreducibly complex and if even one part were removed, the um, organism couldn't function. And so you've got this, um, you know, bare minimum below which you can't go. But um, just wait. I mean, uh, we don't know a process by which the parts could have evolved um, apart from each other, but let's just wait because it inevitably we'll find out how the machine could have made itself. Um, what do you say to that type of thing of just wait, let's just have faith and wait? Well, there's two things I would say. The first one is that, uh, of course, I would encourage scientists to continue to explore evolutionary theories of these irreducibly complex systems, and maybe they can come up with an explanation. Um, however, we have to take the data where it is today, and we have to be willing to accept the possibility that it actually could not have evolved by Darwinian evolution. When they refuse to accept the data that's pointing away from Darwinian evolution and instead put faith in as of yet undiscovered laws, what they're essentially engaging in is evolution of the gaps type thinking. In other words, there's a gap in our knowledge, and I'm going to have faith that it's going to be filled with Darwinian evolution and that, there, that all knowledge is ultimately going to be an evolutionary kind of answer. Um, I think that that is assuming the truth of your own argument, and it's not really engaging in, in true scientific uh, reasoning when you're unwilling to consider the possibility that your theory is basically wrong. Now, that having been said, of course, continue to try to explain it, and if you can come up with an explanation, more power to you. What I would say, though, to somebody who says that um, you know, irreducible complexity uh, can't be explained, and if they're, if they're an evolutionist, I would say, well, obviously, you have not been keeping up with your, what your side has been saying, because, in fact... There are evolutionists who claim that irreducibly complex systems can be explained via an evolutionary explanation, um, and we can get into that some more. Uh, they would claim that the, uh, the theory of co-option or ex exaptation uh, can explain how you can evolve an irreducibly complex system. And we can talk about that. Um, it's different from Darwinian evolution. It's basically uh, exaptation or co-option says that instead of parts evolving for their current purpose initially, they might originally have evolved for a different purpose, and then they were co-opted to serve an entirely new purpose within the cell. So uh, that's basically the, the theory, and we can talk about that, but that's, that's the, uh, the, the typical response that you get. Uh, yeah, and even that, though, I, I guess from from my vantage point, it it surely does seem like some uh, you're you're looking at what you have and really extrapolating and being highly speculative. Is is that a fair analysis? With with the co-option uh, argument, you're saying yes, yes, yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, you can always appeal to some wildly speculative explanation to save your theory from being falsified. As a matter of fact, historians of science have recognized that sometimes. When a theory is in crisis, that's exactly what defenders of the old paradigm will start to do. They'll come up with these ad hoc explanations to save their theories from being falsified. That, that's what the proponents of the geocentric model of the solar system did when their model started to, when they, people would observe the planets going backwards. And proponents of geocentrism came up with this idea called epicycles to explain, well, sometimes planets just engage in retrograde motion and for some reason they go backwards, even though our model of the solar system, the geocentric model, would never predict that. And this is just sort of a quirk of nature that sometimes they will, planets will have these epicycles. Well, uh, evolutionists today use epicycles to save their theory from being falsified. Um, and I'd say that this model of co-option is an epicycle. Essentially what it says is that if uh, you can find any other function for your part in the cell, that cells will somehow be able to bring parts together from entirely different systems many parts all at once to form an entirely new system to perform an entirely new function, none of which they originally adapted, the parts originally adapted to perform, 
and just by sheer dumb luck, you just happen to be adapted to perform this entirely new function, and all these parts fit together, and they all work together and coordinate properly and perform this entirely new function. I mean, the, the only cause that we know of that can borrow parts from the cell and tweak them and modify them in order and borrow them and, and in order to perform an entirely new function, the only cause we know of that can do that is intelligence. So I actually would say that the co-option objection is more of an argument for intelligent design than it is for evolution. Well, let's get to one of the Trump cards that uh, Dawkins and uh, a lot of the others will, will play. Um, and I know we recently had a debate with one of our professors uh, between um, uh, Richard Howe, one of our professors, and Dr. Michael Shermer of Skeptic Magazine. And and we always hear the uh, sound sounds pretty academically impressive the the phrase peer reviewed, and um, you know the, this evolutionists will say, well, you know, there aren't any peer-reviewed, you know, true scientific papers that affirm ID or, um, you know, what you all are saying about irreducible complexity. So what what is peer review? Why does it matter? And are there any peer-reviewed published writings that support uh, what, you know, the Discovery Institute's position would be? Well, the answer is yes. And, and first off, I want to say, I mean, I think Michael Shermer is actually a really nice guy. But even yes. nice guys can make really bad arguments. And when you're, if you're going to argue against intelligent design, this is a tip to the critics out there, at least make an argument that's a valid one. The argument that there are no peer-reviewed articles supporting intelligent design is not a valid argument, because they are. There are peer-reviewed articles. Um, I, the, the Discovery Institute keeps a list of them on our website at discovery.org slash CSC, and you can, visit a, you can find a list of a number of pro-ID peer-reviewed scientific articles from mainstream scientific journals I just blogged about an article that came out uh, recently. I blogged about it la this past week on evolutionnews.org. It was an article by a professor at Leeds University in the United Kingdom, and the article explicitly supports both intelligent design and irreducible complexity. And so that's just a myth. It's sort of an urban legend that gets repeated around by evolutionists because it's just a, such a convenient, convenient argument to make that there are no peer-reviewed articles supporting ID, but it's, it's simply false. Um, there are peer-reviewed articles that have expressly supported both intelligent design and irreducible complexity. I'm not talking about articles, you know, published in Joe's uh, Backwater Creationism Journal. Uh, no offense to any <laughs> resistors named Joe who are creationists, but, I mean, I'm talking about articles published in mainstream scientific journals. They certainly exist, and you can go to discovery.org slash CSC to uh, read a list of them.